It, it's true the U.S. military is a costly enterprise. It cost us more uh, as a share of our total output during the Cold War, but in absolute dollar terms, we're spending about as much now as we spent uh, during the Cold War. So the cost to maintain primacy has remained relatively high. And uh, the question is, could we spend much more on the military to cover some of the gaps between what we ask our military to do and the resources they have to carry out those missions? I think the, the answer is we could spend more, but it's not in our interest to do so. Uh, just spending more on the military won't ensure that the military, for example, will be able to succeed in some of the conflicts that it hasn't yet uh, achieved decisive victory. I think it actually speaks to the limits of military power, uh, that you can spend a lot and you can have the most exquisite military in the world, which we absolutely do, uh, and yet uh, that m same military struggles to defeat determined adversaries wielding uh, crude weapons in places like Iraq or Syria or, or Afghanistan. And I think that really does speak that, that just spending more money on the problem uh, is not likely to solve the problem. Uh, it is likely to encourage us to get more deeply involved in some conflicts that might genuinely be intractable uh, and that ultimately aren't uh, vital to uh, U.S. national security. For a country as powerful as the United States, and especially a country with, uh, with global interests and with uh, a, a large and capable military, it's really important to define ahead of time when that military will be used. Uh, I use some basic criteria. They're consistent with things like the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine from the Cold War and early Cold, uh, post-Cold War period. Things like, what's the national security interest at stake? What are we asking our military to do? Will the public support the mission even if the mission gets difficult and costly? Uh, related, how are we going to pay for it? Will the war be paid for by, for example, uh, a war tax? Or will we uh, uh, pay for it through debt like we did in World War II? Uh, those sorts of questions are important to ask before we send our military into harm's way. And I think that's, an, again, the nature of the U.S. military because it exists and it is so large and strong and in many places simultaneously, it's fairly easy for that military to become involved in conflicts before we ask any of those questions. And so I think it's really important for uh, the American people and for American policymakers to keep in mind some basic criteria for when uh, we use force. Um, the last point I'd make is that, you know, war is a perilous enterprise. It involves the threat of violence and the destruction of property, uh, and therefore we shouldn't enter into it lightly. And so I think when I think of restraint uh, and an instinct of non-intervention, it's more about just a sort of skeptical eye. It's a sort of hesitant to use force. That doesn't mean never using force. It means thinking through it very, very carefully before we do. One of the great uh, disservices we do to the military is to uh, expect uh, the American people to support it at all costs for any reason uh, and not uh, expecting the American people to actually scrutinize the missions that we ask the military to do. In other words, uh, the greatest service that we can do to our veterans is to make sure that there are relatively few of them. Those who, are, who do go to war in defense of vital U.S. national security interests are doing so for the right set of reasons. It, it would almost be unpatriotic, it seems to me, for Americans to not think carefully about the wars that we ask our military to fight. Uh, most of us, the vast majority of us, will have never served in the military, and the few of us who have, uh, I think, understand just what an important undertaking it is. And, and this country is, is quite accustomed to going to war without much debate. Uh, and I think that really is a disservice to, to the military and to, the, to those who serve. A key component of primacy is to reassure our allies. And we do that, for the most part, to uh, discourage them from taking measures to defend themselves. This might sound a little strange, but it actually made some sense after World War II when these countries were badly broken by World War II and endangered by the Soviet Union in Europe. Uh, these countries were in no position to defend themselves. They, were, they had to focus on rebuilding themselves, rebuilding themselves physically, and also rebuilding themselves politically. Uh, so the notion of reassurance as a, as a means to discourage countries from doing more to defend themselves made a certain sense. 
uh, at that time. The challenge, however, is that these countries have become quite stable and secure, and yet we never really revisited the bargain. And so we continue to have free riding behavior or cheap riding behavior, uh, countries not paying what they might need to pay in order to defend themselves. The other problem with uh, having too much reassurance is it can lead to moral hazard. It can lead to reckless driving. That is, if allies believe that the United States has their back no matter what, they might be inclined to behave in reckless ways. They might be inclined to, uh, to take actions that they wouldn't if they were carrying the full burden and the, and the risks. Uh, they might simply uh, be discouraged from undertaking uh, reasonable uh, compromises uh, on behalf of maintaining peace with their neighbors or in their region. And so this, the, the danger is that primacy encourages a, a kind of reckless behavior that ultimately is not conducive to long-term peace. When the United States became the first nuclear weapon state, there was some fear that many other countries would follow. The Soviet Union did, a few other countries did, Britain and, and France. Uh, but uh, by the late 1950s, early 1960s, a pretty concerted effort to discourage other countries from going that route. The fear was that if many countries had nuclear weapons, then the chances of their use would dramatically increase. And a key part of reassurance is to discourage particularly U.S. allies like Germany and Japan from ever being tempted to develop nuclear weapons. In fact, I think in many respects that is one of the key arguments that defenders of primacy make is that were it not for primacy, there would be much, much more nuclear proliferation than there has been. Um, I think it's also true, however, that primacy has encouraged some countries that are left out of the system, the so-called so rogue states, to want to develop nuclear weapons of their own to deter the United States from attacking them. We've seen that in places like uh, North Korea, which is one of the poorest countries on the planet, but has nonetheless managed to develop a nuclear weapon, or the fear that places like Iran might want a nuclear weapon for precisely that same reason. Uh, and so I think it's fair to say that while the U.S. primacy probably has discouraged some of our friends from developing nuclear weapons, it has done sort of a, ha, has sort of a mixed track record of discouraging our uh, adversaries or potential adversaries from wanting nuclear weapons. With the United States so heavily dependent upon military power as its main instrument of engagement with the rest of the world, it's somewhat inevitable that uh, the State Department and traditional diplomacy is sort of relegated to the back seat or to no seat at all. And I think we've certainly seen that happen over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, where the military uh, receives the lion's share of resources that go to engagement, and when uh, the United States is asked or expected to interact with others, uh, it usually comes from people who are at least, uh, if not carrying a weapon themselves, at least backed by people who are. Uh, of course, that's not the way the United States has always interacted with the rest of the world. Traditional diplomacy has gone both from the State Department and our actual official diplomats, but has also been carried by uh, business people and NGOs and, and private actors who interact with the rest of the world. And so I think one of the great dangers of primacy is that because it is defined uh, so much in military terms, it means inevitably that diplomacy is, uh, is sort of given short shrift. Mm -hmm.